This lecture will discuss what's called the chi-square goodness of fit test. This test is appropriate when we have not one proportion, but several proportions. <clears throat> Usually these are called categories, and if the elements of a population can be partitioned into several categories, meaning each element only belongs to one category, we're often interested in whether or not the sample frequencies fit some known distribution. Here's a distribution of student pets, cats, dogs, birds, rabbits, and elephants. Must be students from India. We can look at sample data and compare it to <clears throat> some model <clears throat> by comparing the observed and expected frequencies, treating them as a vector of counts, as points in a k-dimensional space, those k categories, and using a modified version of the Pythagoras formula to compute a squared distance score. So I'm sure we've all seen this guy in high school, where we have two points, observed and expected. And then if we're in Cartesian coordinates, simply take the square of the x distance, the square of the y distance, add them together, and we get the square of the overall distance. This would be good if counts were being measured in, com in comparable units. However, <clears throat> counts are not comparable units if they have different sizes. So we have to rescale them to put them on the same measurement scale. And it turns out we can rescale them by dividing by the expected value uh, in each direction. So we get this modified formula. And here's the modified formula right there. So that's how we do a chi-square score. How do we do a test on this score? Well, we use what's called the chi-square distribution. It's got a variety of applications. One of them is the sampling distribution for variance of normally distributed data. Okay, The chi-square score basically takes the sum of the squares of independent z-scores, just adds them up, and we get a chi-square random variable. Now, if we look at one of the terms in the chi-square score, we say, well, if we think of the count as a Poisson random variable, then the expected value is just the rate parameter lambda, the mean, which is also the variance. Ooh, how handy. Mean, variance. Okay. Um, and then the numerator is just the deviation from the mean squared. And so that's a z squared, z score squared. This thing, of course, is tabulated. There's a chi-square table. Uh, and so these are tail probabilities. And <clears throat> the critical values or tail probabilities, of course, depend on how many z-scores that are added up. Uh, in this table, this is a den denoted df for degrees of freedom. Of course, there's always a catch. How many degrees of freedom do we use compared to the number of categories? So, in K categories, how many is degrees of freedom? About 100 years ago, Ronald Fisher and Carl Pearson had a big argument about this. <clears throat> Fisher being a little bit smarter, <clears throat> but perhaps not as well connected, uh, was gratified to actually win the argument uh, and show that it was K minus one degrees of freedom while Pearson had been holding out for k degrees of freedom. How does that make sense? Well, let's assume that we just have three categories. <clears throat> oh, I know, we'll call them something really clever like x, y, and z. Um, <clears throat> now, since we know the total number of counts in the sample, x plus y plus z equals some constant t, and this is just the equation of a plane. So <clears throat> any point x, y, z has to be on that plane in order to maintain the total. 
Well, how many dimensions does a plane have? This is a two-dimensional surface, which means two degrees of freedom. Pretty slick. Let's look at an example of how this test might work. So <clears throat> we'll start by doing something really, really simple. We'll try to test a fair die. So I suspect someone is using a loaded die in a game of craps. <clears throat> when he's out of the room, I quickly roll the die 60 times and count how many times each spot occurs. And so here we go. I've got spots one through six. I expect 10, basically 60 divided by 6, uh, for each of the spots, but I get these values, 12, 7, 6, 19, 7, 9, and I notice I'm light on 3s and heavy on 4s. So now what I'd like to do is test this using the chi-square test to see if it's fair. Six categories means 5 degrees of freedom. I look, that up, look up a 5% tail, and I get a critical value of 11.07. You can always go back and check it on the table. So I square my deviations for all of these guys. Divide by the expected value and add them all up. And I get 12.0, which is greater than 11.07. So I reject the null hypothesis. The die is loaded. Clearly in favor of the four. Recall that the three is on the opposite face of the die, so it tends to come up showing the four, not showing the three. Obviously, the weight is on the side of the three. Now, if I'd like to conduct this test without having to bang it all into the calculator in R, I can use this command, chi-square test, and then just give it the frequencies. The default is for the probabilities of each category to be the same. Let's look at a, something a little more related to biology. So we'll take a really, really simple model from genetics we're going to cross heterozygous plants, which express color based on a genotype, uh, with homozygous dominant plants, that is, two dominant genes having red flowers, recessive plants, two recessives have white flowers, and heterozygous crosses have pink flowers. So if we go a Punit square, showing the results of the crosses, we see that we get one dominant, one recessive, and two crosses or mixed. So we expect these to show up in the ratio of one to two to one. That means that if we look at 24 flowers, the expected count should be six, 12, and six. <clears throat> we observe a sample of 24 having counts of eight, 12, and four. We plug that into the chi-square formula, and we're looking at two degrees of freedom in this case. So <clears throat> we take the squared deviations divided by the expecteds. Ooh, I like that term. It's zero. When we get all done, we get 1.33. Actually, one and a third going out forever. <clears throat> and so we do not reject the null. Okay, so data fits model. Again, if we don't like to do hand calculation, we can do this in R. This time we give it the frequencies and we give it the expected proportions. And these must add to one. That's not bad. Now let's look at a little more realistic problem, one that has some legs to it. 
And this is a very famous problem. Uh, <clears throat> in 1898, a Polish mathematician Borkowitz tabulated the number of deaths by horse kick from 10 Russian Prussian Army Corps over a period of 20 years. And now realize this was this was in a time when <clears throat> high-speed communication was a telegraph. He actually rode all over Prussia to accumulate this data. And so he looked at these frequencies. Most corps had no deaths, but there were ones, there were twos, there were threes, and there was even one with four deaths in one year. Okay? And he thought this phenomenon could be modeled with a Poisson distribution. So, <clears throat> was he right? Borkowitz suspected that it would follow a Poisson distribution, and he estimated the rate at 0.61 deaths per core year. So now, let's test to see if it fits the Poisson. So, using his estimated rate parameter, <clears throat> we calculated the Poisson proportions and multiplied them by 200. So, <clears throat> the observed is just n times p sub i, where the p sub i is Poisson. And <clears throat> we get these expected values. Wow, 108, 66, 21.22, 4, and 0.71. If we graph it, this looks like a good fit. But of course, we need to do the test. However, there are some secret rules for the goodness of fit test. The first one, the toughie is, <clears throat> all expected values must be greater than 5. And what about estimating the right parameter instead of just knowing it. What do we do? Well, we do what anybody does when they have a problem. We bribe our way out of it. So, bribes equals degrees of freedom, because that's all we have to give away. So the first thing we'll do is we'll consolidate the smaller classes. We'll take the three and four <clears throat> categories and lump them into one, and then that will cause us to lose a degree of freedom. We'll sacrifice another degree of freedom for using one estimated parameter, basically one degree of freedom per parameter when you do the estimation. We get these values, okay? <clears throat> we can go ahead and calculate the chi-square statistic for that, and we get 0.193, which we compare to a chi-square with two degrees of freedom at 5%, 5.99, and so the data fits the model. Do not reject. the null hypothesis. Again, we can do this with R. We'll get fancy this time. We'll define a vector of expected values. And then when we do our chi-square test, we'll give it the observed values. And we'll convert the expected values to proportions by taking that vector and dividing it by its sum. The only problem is the degrees of freedom will be wrong. For some reason, R doesn't give us the capability to adjust the degrees of freedom. But the test statistic will be correct, and so that will be fine. Now, there is a note. Chi-square test is opposite in <clears throat> meaning. to standard hypothesis tests. So usually, the only time we get a strong result is when we reject the null with strong evidence. However, <clears throat> practitioners use the chi-square to test goodness of fit. This is opposite in nature. That is, they want to not reject the null. Very, very strict interpretationalist statisticians don't think this is correct, but the rest of the world doesn't care. In other words, statisticians 
suck it up.